Bitcoin is used to facilitate an awful lot of bad stuff. Um, it's not just things like online drug dealing, it's things like um, you know viruses which will encrypt your hard disk and hold you up to ransom from the original crypto locker through things like WannaCry. And in the old days, kidnapping just didn't work because you couldn't get the money away. And the existence of cryptocurrencies changes that in, in ways that may have wider ramifications. What we've been looking at um, is how you go about tracking stolen bitcoins. Suppose you're foolish enough to let people know that you've got $10 million worth of bitcoins and somebody comes into your house and sticks a gun up your nostril and gets you to transfer them to him. How can you go about tracing the stolen loot? Well, people have known since the beginning of Bitcoin that you can in fact trace stuff because the blockchain is entirely public and all the transactions are there for everybody to see. But how do you go about doing this in practice? People like Malta Moser and Reiner Burma came up with a couple of approaches. The first approach, they said, is poison tainting. And poison tainting means that if you put a bad Bitcoin um, into a transaction or address, then it poisons everything that's there. So if you open a new wallet and you put in three stolen Bitcoins and then seven freshly mined Bitcoins, then when you go and spend that UTXO, it's 10 stolen Bitcoins. The problem with this is that over a few thousands or tens of thousands of blocks, it completely poisons the entire blockchain, or at least the active blockchain that people are using for trading. So the second method that they come up with was what they call haircut tainting. And here, if you put three stolen Bitcoins into a new wallet and then seven freshly mined ones, then you end up spending 10 Bitcoins, each of which is 30% tainted, and you just write the software to track all this. Now, the problem with haircut tainting is that within a few thousand blocks, you end up with all the active Bitcoins in the blockchain being tainted just a little bit under 10%, because something over 6% of all Bitcoins have been stolen at least once. So what can we do about this? Well, the breakthrough came when I was talking with David Fox, who was one of our law lecturers and is now a law prof at Edinburgh. And he pointed me to what lawyers know as Clayton's case. And this was a judgment of the High Court in London in 1816 um, after a bank went bankrupt during the Napoleonic War and they had to sort out who owned what uh, among the rubble. And the master of the rolls, one of the senior judges in England at the time, ruled that you had to do first in, first out, right? The first money that went into an account is used to satisfy the first checks that are drawn on it. And so this gives us a sound legal basis for trying to do some computer science because first in, first out, or FIFO, is something that programmers and communications engineers understand very, very well. So we went and wrote some software which does a FIFO tent of the blockchain. And so whenever coins are stolen and put in a transaction, perhaps joined with other coins, the coins that went in first are the coins that go out. The first Satoshi in is the first Satoshi out and so on. And when we run this over the blockchain, we find that a fascinating thing happens, that the taint remains concentrated rather than being spread out. So for example, if you look at a theft of about a thousand bitcoins in 2014 and trace it forward to 2016, then if you use poison tainting or haircut tainting, then it affects about one and a half million addresses, which is a lot. However, um, if you use FIFO tainting, then only 11,000 addresses are affected. So what's happening here um, is that bad bitcoins tend to keep on circulating in bad neighborhoods of the internet. And we find that whereas, you know, with haircut tainting, most of the bitcoins out there are tainted one way or another, if you use FIFO tainting, then the majority of bitcoins aren't tainted at all. The taint is concentrated um, among oh gosh, about 20% or so of the Bitcoin stock. All of a sudden, we've got a practical way to trace stolen Bitcoins, both over the short term, if somebody came and did an armed robbery at your house yesterday, and over the medium term, if a Bitcoin exchange goes bust and it turns out that somebody inside it has been stealing Bitcoins for a year or so. So it, it, it's fit for both purposes. And this has got all sorts of impl interesting implications um, now that the regulators have started insisting that Bitcoin exchanges be regulated. Now, the, the US Financial Crimes Enforcement Network, which is part of the US Treasury, started um, requiring Bitcoin exchanges to be regulated in 2013. They busted BTCE, which was a big criminal-operated Bitcoin exchange in Greece, and they went and busted a few places in America as well. And so now the message has got across, and even in 
you know, relatively remote places like the Philippines, they've now got round to passing laws saying that all Bitcoin exchanges have got to register as foreign exchange dealers. And that means that when you change Bitcoins, whether into dollars or euros or pounds or even into pesos, um, you've got to produce your passport and a couple of utility bills so that there's a record of who you are. The European Union, for its part, has decided when they uh, amend the fourth anti-money laundering directive that they're going to require companies who provide hosted Bitcoin wallet services to also um, fall under the regulation. And this means that if you get your Bitcoin wallet run online by a service company, as the great majority of Bitcoin users do, then you'll have to provide your passport and your gas bills just as if you were opening an account at HSBC. There's an interesting top level view of this, which is that very often when a new disruptive technology comes along, um, people build systems and they completely ignore the existing laws for a while and they try and build something better. And if they do build something better, then it gets uh, you know, blessed with regulation and absorbed into the system. Uber comes along and it says, we're not a taxi company, we're a service company, we're a platform. And um, so they start providing cheap taxi rides in London and then people notice that um, some of the cars are unsafe, that the drivers are working 16 hours a day, that they're getting less than minimum wage, that they're not getting criminal records background checks, that sometimes they rape customers and the crimes aren't reported. And eventually the mayor of London says, listen, pal, you are a taxi company and we're pulling your license. See you in court. And the moral is that very often when you get a new and disruptive phenomenon coming along, um, you can sort it out perfectly well by applying existing law to it. Once you can figure out an intelligent way to do that. And so what we've done um, is produce software which enables you to track stolen bitcoins effectively. And we're going to be making this publicly available so that if your bitcoin gets stolen, you can apply it to the, dot, the blockchain and you can find where your property's gone. And we're also going to be publishing a taint chain, which will be a public list of coins that have been publicly reported to be stolen. And we hope that that will be taken over by the authorities, perhaps by Europol or somebody like that, uh, and will then have to be um, taken into account uh, by Bitcoin exchanges when they ponder whether to give value for a piece of cryptocurrency that somebody's offered them. If I'm holding some Bitcoin and as far as I know legitimately, why do I want to go and find out if they might actually be stolen? Well, this, 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 is, a, uh, this is a perpetual problem um, with anti-money laundering um, measures in that nobody actually wants to know the truth, right? Citibank what doesn't want to know that they've got John Gotti as a customer and they would push back very, very hard against laws which said that Citibank CEO had to go to jail if it turned out that a mafia boss was a customer. So instead they lobby for laws which say that uh, so long as Citibank has got a passport and two gas bills off every customer, they don't have to go to jail. And so Mr. Gotti is good at finding passports and gas bills and <laughs> Citibank doesn't have to go to jail and everybody's happy. And so we've got ourselves at a, a, an equilibrium in the anti-money laundering world of traditional money that doesn't really quite work. However, once you move into the world of cryptocurrencies, the fact that cryptocurrencies are completely uh, traceable changes the game entirely. It, you know, once you have got public information of what money went where and when, it suddenly becomes impossible to, for banks to turn around and say, now hang on a minute, we didn't know. So the Bitcoin people have been lobbying for at least five years to have Bitcoin to be declared money because if Bitcoin becomes money, money then... They... Now, what if there was a secret mathematical relationship between P and Q? Would that change anything? What if P was actually equal to some multiple of Q?